The reading this morning is from Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 through 9, 12 through 14, 19 through 21, and chapter 6, verse 1. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. The same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks, as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, Let us go and offer sacrifices to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men, that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. So the people were scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters were urgent, saying, Complete your work, your daily task each day, as when there was straw. And the foremen of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, Why have you not done all your task of making bricks today and yesterday, as in the past? The foremen of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, You shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily task each day. They met Moses and Aaron, who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they said to them, The Lord look on you and judge, because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Anna. Uh, My name is Austin Lennox. I'm one of the pastors on staff here, and if I haven't met you yet, we'd love to remedy that by the end of the service. And um, as I was thinking about uh, our text this week, there was a story uh, that I heard about a man named uh, Dr. John Gershner. He uh, was a seminary professor, speaker, kind of did lots of things. This was almost 100 years ago. Uh, but he was, he was speaking at this youth missions conference, kind of this event for teenagers to try to uh, drum up uh, interest in overseas missions. And uh, the title of kind of his address to these, these teenagers was uh, A Living Sacrifice. And so the whole thrust of his message uh, was this, this plea to these kids. He said, hey, take, take your hands off your life. Take your hands off your life. Give it fully to Jesus, his plan for you. And he talks about this young woman who was in attendance. This was in like the 1930s. And he said she was different. There was something about her. You know, he'd heard lots of kind of empty promises, like, yes, this is great. He said she was totally different full commitment. He'd never seen anything like it. Just totally sold. Uh, She had this huge heart for Asia. She's like 15, 16. She's researching agencies that she wants to partner with so that she can go and and spend her life doing overseas, you know, mission work in Asia, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. Uh, And and the one that she goes with had had some stipulations. They say, okay, yeah, yeah, we we, we want you. But after after high school, uh, you got to go to Bible college. You got to go to Bible college, get a four-year degree. Uh, and then after that, uh, you got to go to cross-cultural theological training, kind of what we would call seminary today. And she said, okay. And they said, uh, you have to be married. You have to be married, right? So 1930s, they, they just weren't sending, you know, single American women to the mission field at the time for whatever reason. And uh, so she said, okay. And so that night, you know, she went back to her bedroom and, and sat on the side of the bed and was praying. She said, Jesus, I... I give my life to you. I, I, I'm taking my hands off my life. You know, it's not about what I want. Uh, I don't want safety or comfort or riches. I just, I need a husband. I need you to provide a husband so that I can go do, do this thing that I feel like you're calling me to do. 
So she graduates from high school. She goes to Bible college. She spends four years there. She graduates. She gets her degree. And on graduation night, no boyfriend, no husband, no prospects. And she's kind of sitting there thinking like, okay, God, I, I, I take my hands off my life. I've given my life to you. I, I don't want safety or comfort or riches or any of those things. That's not who I am. I, I, I just need you to give me a husband so I can do this thing. And so she goes to cross-cultural ministry training and theological study for four years, and she graduates. And on graduation night, there's no boyfriend, no husband, no prospects. And just kind of in her raw vulnerability, she says she sits down and she prays, and she says, God, how how could you do this to me? How could you do this to me? I've, I've given up eight years of my life. I've done everything that you wanted me to do. I'm doing all these things that I feel like you're calling me to do. And you can't just give me this one thing that I need to do it. You won't come through for me on this one thing that I need. And I, I just wonder if something like that resonates with you. I, I just feel like probably 80, 90% of us show up with, with unmet hopes, unmet dreams, unmet ex- expectations. We, we're like, God, I know I'm not perfect. <laughs> But I kind of avoided the big sins, and I'm trying to do the right thing, and and I just don't feel like you're coming through. I don't feel like you're holding up your end of the bargain. This life, this is not not what I deserve. We're frustrated. We're angry. God hasn't come through. We kept up our end of the deal, and we don't feel like he's come through for us. And so, look, if if Exodus is this, as we've been saying all summer, if, if it's this big story of salvation, if this is the picture book version of kind of what it looks like for God to save his people, then Exodus 5, what Anna just read for us, it's the story of the frustration that comes from that. Of, it's the frustration of salvation. It's the frustration of, of doing everything right and it not working. and just doesn't work out for you. So Exodus 5, it's a story about that feeling because what Anna just read, it looks like evil wins. It looks like good doesn't. Right in the face of doing everything right, it looks like Pharaoh comes out on top and life is worse for God's people. And, and usually their lives are terrible because of their own disobedience. And in this passage, their, their lives got harder because they, they did the right thing. They did what God said. They listened to him. They did everything they were supposed to. And so I, I just want us to think about Exodus 5 in three ways. What are the effects of disobedience? What are the effects of obedience? And then so what? Why do we care? Why does this matter for us? Because really what Exodus 5 does, it it asks you and me this question. It says, okay, does does Christianity, does following the God of the Bible, does it work? Does it make your life easier or harder? So the effects of disobedience, the effects of obedience, so what? Why do we care? All right, so hopefully very quickly, the effects of disobedience. In other words, what what does not following God look like? And what what does it get you uh, in this chapter? Well, if you look at verse 1, it says, Moses and Aaron, they went and they said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. God's giving Pharaoh a chance. He's giving him a chance. He's saying, look, you, you have this opportunity to listen to me, to respond to what I have to say in faith, to believe me, to let these people go. And he doesn't. Right? Pharaoh says, no, I, who is the Lord? He's like, I don't care about this guy. I'm not going to let this guy get in the way of my bottom line, of my free labor, right? He says, uh, in fact, he doubles down, right? If you start in verse 7 and read all the way through verse 11, which it's not all printed in your bulletin, but basically what he says, he essentially says, I'm actually going to make your life worse, right? I'm going to make your life harder. Uh, you, you actually have to produce the same amount of bricks now that you used to, but I'm not going to give you any straw to do it. You're going to have to go find that on your own, and good luck, because there's not a lot. And so basically, he says, okay, look, in the face of you doing this thing that you feel like your God's telling you to do, I'm going to crush you. I'm going to make your life miserable. I'm going to just beat you into the ground. And like Moses and Aaron, they're not even asking for that much. Did you notice that, that all they want is a three days journey into the wilderness to worship, make sacrifices, worship their God, and then come back? They're saying, like, can you give us a week? Give us a week off so we can go do this thing. Pharaoh's like, no, make you work harder instead. And so, look, the, the effects of sin, the effects of disobedience, like if you're looking at Pharaoh, in the short term, it works. Right? It works. He, he gets more free labor than he had before. 
right? He gets to drive these people that, 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 that are expecting to be freed just further into slavery, drives them into the ground. Like his disobedience, it works. It works for him. And it just makes me think, okay, man, it is just so much easier to just lie. Like in, in life, it is just so much easier to lie. Oh, that would just make it so much easier sometimes. Just not tell the truth, not deal with that. Can we just lie about this? It makes me think about how easy it is uh, to turn to things like pornography, substance abuse. It, like, it's so easy because it works. It works. I grew up in a, in a youth group that told me, like, sin's the worst thing ever. It's good. You're going to have a terrible time. And I was like, I don't know. It's kind of working. It's kind of awesome. This feels kind of great. And I haven't really gotten in, in trouble with that much for it yet. And all these bad things you're telling me are going to happen haven't happened. Right? In the short term, it, disobedience, it seems to work. Right? It makes me think about me, me and Meredith were walking. I was like, what is like an example of this? Like something that works in the short term but doesn't in the long term. I couldn't think of anything. But, but I did think about when we were in Colorado last week or two weeks ago as a youth group. We were fishing. And we were fishing. And um, you just have to think from the fish's perspective, right? They see this like incredible, colorful, you know, juicy lure drop out of the sky. And they're like, this is the greatest day of my life. Uh, this amazing meal has just presented itself. Like this is so easy. I'm, I I'm going to eat this thing. And if it was the fish that ate one of our things, he got drug out of the water and like passed around to like every kid in the youth group to like take pictures and send home. And by the end of it, the fish is like flopping dead, you know, on the side of the thing. He's like, I just wanted a snack. Like, I just wanted to, I just wanted to eat the thing. And, and, and that's really funny and, and everything. But like that, it's the same way for us. Like we think, oh man, okay, look, here's this shiny quick fix. Here's this shiny quick fix. Just disobey a little bit. Like this has been the rules. Put, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but it works. It's going to work. Right? It's shiny, and then we bite, and we find ourselves trapped in these webs of deceit that we've created with our lives that now we have to, it's like a second full-time job to just try to hold up this kind of like false life we've created. You, you find yourself addicted. You find yourself anxious. You find yourself emptier than you were before. Uh, I realized a couple weeks ago that my literary uh, references are out of date. Not everybody has read The Outsiders uh, like when I was 10. But uh, maybe you're familiar with John Steinbeck. Do you all know who John Steinbeck is? Grapes of Wrath, East of Eden, Of Mice and Men, The Red Pony, uh, In Dubious Battle, Travels with Charlie. Um, he says this. He says, underneath their topmost layers of frailty, men want to be good and they want to be loved. He says, actually, indeed, most of our vices are attempted shortcuts to love. Because most of our vices as human beings are just attempted shortcuts to love. See, we just show up for some reason intuitively assuming, okay, to follow God, to do the right thing, to obey, that, that, that leads to less joy, less satisfaction, less life, less happiness. So we take shortcuts, and we think, actually, I, th I think coming over here is going to do it. You, you could almost nickname sin a shortcut to life, shortcut to happiness. And so if that's some of the effects of disobedience. Well, well how, how does the disobedience and sin of Pharaoh affect Pharaoh? What, what does it do to him as a person? Um, what, one of the commentators that I read said this. He says, okay, to resist the light, to resist the light means increased darkness. And here's what he meant. He says, okay, it, to those who refuse to repent, right, to bow down to God and say, okay, okay, I submit, I follow you, like, I'm going to do what you say. He says that for those who refuse to repent, they become more impenitent, more defiant, more lawless, until eventually, he says, God just kind of abandons them over to their own way of life. He says, okay, you're, you're running so, so hard away from me. I, here you go. You got it. I'll just release you. Right, because look at verse 9. By the end of verse 9, Pharaoh is basically saying, these are lying words. There's no God. They're lying. He, he, he's calling, he doesn't know it, he's calling the God of the universe a liar. And so do you see the progression of disobedience that to us we're like, I, I'm, just, I'm just breaking a rule. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just kind of skirting around what I know I'm supposed to be doing. And Exodus 5 says, no, you, you're, you're waging war against like the truth of existence. <laughs> you're, you're at odds with the character of the creator of everything. And so in, in the short term, what disobedience and sin will get you is it, it works. It works in the short term. But it makes life harder on those around you. 
And, and it, it turns you into someone who's not simply just doing bad things. You, you, you start thinking of God in a bad way. And so if that's the effect of disobedience, if that's what sin does, what's, what's the effect of obedience? What's the effect of doing the right thing? Uh, well, it's kind of uh, like in science class where, where it's an equal and opposite reaction, right? Obedience kind of gets this equal and opposite reaction because what, what Exodus 5 says is like, look, if, if you do the right thing, like if, you, if you really do, if you do the right thing, if you try to follow God, like, it, it might feel miserable in the short term. I love that. It doesn't doesn't pull any punches. This is no rose-colored glasses about what uh, following God looks like. It says, okay, it might look like suffering. It might look like frustration. It, it is going to often look like unmet hopes, dreams, and expectations. Look at verse 1, right? Moses goes. He goes to, he, he does everything he's supposed to do. He says everything he's supposed to say, and his life gets harder, not easier. And the lives of the Israelites, God's people, their lives get harder and not easier. Right, verse 14, you see that these four men of the nation of Israel, they're being beaten for their inability to do this impossible task of making bricks without straw. And they come to Moses, you know, and they say, you've made us stink, right? You've made our lives worse too. You doing the right thing has hurt us. And you just have to think about, like, how crestfallen Moses and Aaron are. Like, they just got done, like, talking face-to-face with the God of the universe. He says, hey, I'm going to send you to the most powerful man in the known world, and you're going to do these incredible things and speak on my behalf, and he's going to free you from slavery. Like they, they had to have just been like riding high. They're like, we're going to go stick it to Pharaoh. Right? We're going to free our people. We're going to be heroes. And then we get this. Right? They did what God said. They did what they were supposed to do. Their life gets harder and not easier. And Israelites, their lives get harder and not easier. Right? Look at verse 21. They say, look, you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh, They've got swords coming after us, right? His servants have it out for us. They're being mischaracterized as idle. They're being misrepresented. They're like, hey, we're having our character maligned out here. We're just trying to go worship the God of the universe. And so the obedience of Moses and Aaron, them trying to do the right thing, it's got Israel being hated in the eyes of Egypt, and it's got Moses and Aaron being hated in the eyes of Israel. And and what you get in verse 22, in, in just this raw, honest vulnerability Moses has the guts to say what what we think, but are too afraid to say to God. He says, Lord, why why have you done this? What are you doing? He calls it evil. He says, why have you done evil to us? Why did you ever send me? Ever since I got to Pharaoh, started doing what you told me to do, telling him what you told me to say, he's done evil to us. And you can just sense this frustration, this disappointment, because Moses wants what we want. We just want it to work. We just say, okay, look, I, I, I put in, we treat God like a cosmic vending machine. We say, look, God, I put in the prayer and the church, and I take my kids, you know, to the right schools. I don't parent like those people. I don't act like these people. I'm putting these coins into the vending machine, and I'm, I'm expecting you to give me blessing. And this text just flies in the face of that. It reveals that we, we treat Christianity the way that other people treat other religions, which is that it's a transaction. We treat God like a business partner. We say, hey, look, I held up my end of the deal over here. When are you going to come through and give me what I want? And look, so many of you in this room from firsthand experience, you know that this, this is just not true. This is just not how it works. Right? Moses, he, he's at the center of God's will, and it's awful. He's at the center of God's will, and it's awful. It's hard. And that just flies in the face of transactional spirituality. Uh, it makes me think of this uh, missionary named John Patton, uh, who was a, a missionary over a century ago to this, um, these islands called the New Hebrides that was full of these kind of warring cannibal tribes. And one night, he, he's being pursued by these hostile natives, these people that he came to kind of love and save and rescue. And, and he's up a tree, literally. He, he's, a, he's in the top of this chestnut tree, and that's where he has to sleep because they're chasing him. And in his autobiography, he says this. He says, I climbed into the tree... And I was left alone in the bush. The hours I spent there lived before me as if they were yesterday. I heard the frequent discharging of muskets, the yells from the natives. Yet I sat there among the branches as safe as as if I was in the arms of Jesus himself. He said, never in all of my sorrows did my Lord draw nearer to me and speak more soothingly to my soul. 
than when the moonlight flickered among those chestnut leaves and the night air played against my sweating brow as I told all of my heart to Jesus. Right, like, this dude is being obedient. <laughs> He's being obedient to the Great Commission. He's going to the ends of the earth to, to preach the gospel. And it's got him up a tree as these cannibals are trying to eat him. He's following God. His wife and his child, they die. They die after he arrives on these islands. He's facing legitimate threats to his life every day. And this is what he says. He continues in his autobiography, He's still in the tree. He says, I was alone, yet I was not alone. He said, if it be to glorify God, I would not grudge to spend every night alone in such a tree, to feel again my Savior's spiritual presence, to enjoy his consoling fellowship. And then he addresses you and he addresses me. He says, if you feel like you've been thrown back on your own soul, if you feel all alone, if you are in the midnight, in the bush, in the tree, in the very embrace of death itself, he says, do you have a friend that won't fail you? Says, do you have a friend, do you have a helper who will not fail you? And today, Christianity is the dominant religion in this part of the world. It took decades, but he saw conversions, he saw real conversions, and the gospel took root. Look, short-term pain, suffering, misery, frustration, agony, long-term glory. And so Exodus 5 and John Patton's story, they, they force us to answer this question. Do, do you worship a God who is big enough and good enough that you would still follow him when doing so is going to cause massive amounts of pain and suffering? And I, I think the only way to say yes to that question is, is if you think about the fact that in, in Jesus Christ, God has gone through massive amounts of pain and suffering to win you. All right, see, Jesus was sweet to John Patton in the tree because John Patton knew Jesus went to the tree for him. Right? He's clinging to this tree for dear life, and he says, okay, I can cling to Jesus because I know that Jesus, too, hung from a tree for me. Right, the, I think the only way it's possible to maintain faith, to maintain hope, when it feels like God is actually introducing more suffering, more pain and more agony into your life, is if you, you look at the cross and you say, okay, the same thing happened to my Savior. And it happened because he did everything perfectly. Do you see that? J Jesus' punishment, it, it was not for being disobedient. It was for being obedient. And so you, you think to yourself, when I'm in the midst of pain and suffering for doing the right thing, and you're tempted to think God's abandoned you, he doesn't love you, he doesn't care about you, you think, okay, did God abandon Jesus? Does he not love Jesus? Does he not care about Jesus? If, if Jesus, if he is your savior and if he is your example, it, it will lead to suffering. It will. It's promised. Y your allegiance to Jesus, it, it may not look like you're running for your life from cannibals, uh, it may look like you're running for your life from people that you go to school with, <laughs> people that you work with. I, I don't know. That, that, that Being obedient to Jesus, it might not make you popular. It might make you stink in the sight of whoever your Pharaoh is. I don't know who it is. Right? You, you might be here, and your, your commitment to following the God of the Bible mean, means that you are still single for, for a variety of reasons. And you can look at the cross, and you can say, okay, somehow my, my, my Savior knows how that feels too. That he knows how that feels too. He hasn't, I'm not enduring a suffering that he hasn't gone through. And so in all of these ways, in all of these places, and in countless others, Exodus 5 says, obedience will lead you into deep anguish and suffering. But that maybe that's exactly where God meets people. That at the bottom, that that's where he is, waiting on you. And so, so what? Right, that's the effects of disobedience, works in the short term, doesn't work in the long term, makes life hard for everybody around you and yourself, turns you into someone you, know, you don't want to be. Effects of obedience, uh, miserable in the short term. <laughs> Might introduce more pain, more suffering to my life. Um, so what? Why should you care? Why would you listen? Also, you should be asking, why would anyone do this? <laughs> why would anyone sign up for this? Why would anyone be a Christian? <laughs> um, a, a friend of mine, Jason Sterling, he tells this story about his daughter, Kate. Um, when he was RUF campus minister at Ole Miss, 
uh, he and his wife on Sunday nights after they put the kids to bed. They had this uh, kind of tradition of, of just going out back uh, to the fireplace and, and building, a, building a fire, kind of debriefing about the week and catching up. And um, they said after 30 minutes of being out there, they started to hear uh, this, this wailing through the walls. And they're like, is this coming from like the neighbor's house or somewhere else in the neighborhood? They just hear this wailing coming through the walls, this weeping. And they realize, oh, this is, this is our house. This is one of our kids. And so they, they walk in, and their, their oldest, eight, Kate, who's eight, um, she's, she's walking around the house just sobbing uncontrollably. And they're like, Kate, like, what is going on? What, what, is, what are you doing? And she's like, I just thought you left us. She said, I couldn't find you. You weren't in your rooms. I just, I thought you left us. I thought you left us. And what does even the worst parent do in that moment? Right? They, they scoop down, they pick her up, and they say, we're never going to leave you. We're never gonna leave. We've never left you in the past. We have come through for you every day of your life. We're never going to leave you. We're never going to leave you. They didn't get mad at Kate for thinking that. They just recited the promises. They just said the same thing that they've said over and over and over again, which is exactly what God does for Moses. Right, the last verse Anna read, chapter 6, verse 1, in the midst of all this, all this pain, dis- disappointment, frustration, it says, but the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, he will send them out. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of this land. And I'm going to be honest, I would have rolled my eyes. <laughs> I'd have been like, we've heard this before. You've said this. Like, if you've been here all summer, you're kind of like, when's it actually going to happen? We've been here for like weeks and nothing's happened. They're still in prison. And look, in most of chapter 6, the reason I didn't put it in the bulletin is because what God does, he just says everything he's already said before. He doesn't get mad at Moses. He doesn't get impatient. He graciously, slowly, tenderly, and patiently just recites the exact same thing he said to him before over and over and over again. Right? It doesn't bother God that Moses needs to be reminded again and again, okay, you are true, you are there, that's right, okay, you will do it. And note, notice who the subject is uh, of chapter 6, verse 1, right? It's not like God says, hey, because of what you did, Pharaoh's going to do all this stuff. No, the subject of chapter 6, verse 1 is God. He says, look, I, I'm going to do all this. Like, you, you are so hung up in your own life, your own ability, your own performance. I, I'm the one who's doing it all. I'm going to do it all. The, the story of Exodus It's not about God's people doing the right things so that they could be freed from slavery. It's about God doing everything. He shows up and does everything. And so what Moses had to do is he he had to remind himself of what God had said, and he had to cling to those words, even when his circumstances and his surroundings were just screaming at him an opposite truth. In the face of everything he was seeing, in the face of everything, the the, the apparent defeat, his suffering, he he had to trust God's character, even when his surroundings didn't match up, which is what we call faith. That's what faith is. And so it's the same for us. You, you have to cling to things God has said to you when things were great, right? When you could hear them and believe them, you have to cling to those promises when things are terrible. Here, here's one, Isaiah fifty-seven fifteen. God says, I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit. I revive the soul of the lowly. I revive the heart of the contrite. That that is something you cling to in deep pain and suffering. Or you think about this, Romans 8, 28. God causes everything to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And before that even exits my mouth, I know that it is so easy. I do it myself. You roll your eyes. You're like, I know, I know. I've heard it before. It doesn't help. (laughs) It just doesn't help. Look, these promises, they are not trite cliches or gotcha comments that you just throw like a grenade into the hard situations of someone else's life. Like, God used the crucifixion of his son to save the world. All things work together for good. It, that is not a quick quip that's just going to fix you, but that, that is a deep and profound mystery that is going to take the rest of your life to fully experience. But, but it is a promise to cling to like a life raft. Or do, do you remember the woman at the beginning of the story that Dr. Gershner was talking about? The, the rest of her story goes like this. She says, okay, I was sitting on the edge of my bed, 
was crying out, weeping, struggling, wrestling. And, it, and she said, it dawned on me. The reason I was so miserable was because I thought I had taken my hands off my life. I thought I had truly surrendered everything to Jesus, and I realized I hadn't. I still had this vice grip on this ideal life that I had envisioned in my head, and I was using all of these things, Bible college, seminary, all of this stuff, to try to put God in my debt. I said, surely if I do these things, he'll give me what I want. I need a husband. Right? She did everything in her power to put God in her debt. She, she said she realized I had been using God my entire life to get these things I thought I needed from him instead of just getting him, getting him for the sake of having him. And so again, the only way you and I are gonna be able to truly take our hands off our lives and say, okay, you, you do whatever you want, is if you look at Jesus and you look at the crucifixion and you look at the resurrection and say, okay, if the gospel's true, I can take my hands off my life because God's always got his on mine right? Look, again, you should be asking yourself, why would I sign up for this? Why would I do this? Quick answer, because it's true. It's the only true thing. Um, less quick answer. Like, the only way it's possible to endure what you're going to lose to follow Jesus is if you look at what he lost to come get you. Right? The Philippians 2 says he gave up heaven to come to earth. Right, that he was unjustly murdered, tortured, abused, abandoned. His character was maligned. He was misrepresented and mischaracterized. Right, murdered illegally, hanging helpless on a cross so that, so that we who are helpless could always have help. Right, if, if that is the thing that your soul stares at all the time, then when you're going through deep suffering and pain and anguish and disappointment, you can say, okay, it can't be because God doesn't love me. It just can't be because God doesn't love me. Look at what, look at what he's done. Look at who Jesus is. Really, you worship a God who knows exactly what it's like to do everything right and for it to still not work out. He, he know, what if your suffering is actually proof that you belong to him? Have you thought about that? What if the deep suffering, pain, and anguish is actually proof that you, you might really belong to him? You might really be doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Because it's giving you this chance and this opportunity to say, okay, in a small way, I'm getting a little bit of a taste of what Jesus felt for me. I I'm becoming a little bit more like this Jesus who I say I really love. Uh, there's a, a pastor named Gardner Taylor. Um, he's this pastor in the Deep South years ago. And he moved to New York City. He eventually became a preaching professor at Harvard. And he was telling this story uh, about... Um, when he was younger, uh, he was preaching way out in the country of Louisiana, and th this was like they had just gotten power. Uh, this church, way out in the middle of nowhere in Louisiana, they'd just gotten power. They had one light bulb hanging uh, in their sanctuary, and it's an evening service, and y'all can tell where this is going. Uh, he's preaching, and all of a sudden, power goes out. And this is like middle of nowhere. It is pitch black. I mean, he's probably my age, if not younger, and he, he has no idea what to do. He can't see his notes. He can't see his hand in front of his face. And he's fumbling around. He's not prepared for this. And, and he says that some elderly voice, some elderly man in the back row just yells out. And he says, what are you waiting on? <laughs> and he says, we can still see Jesus in the dark. He says, hey, we can, we can still see Jesus in the dark. And look, that, that's the invitation. That's the invitation this morning. Like, you may be in the dark. You may be in the thick of it you can still see Jesus. Because on the cross, that, that's exactly where he was for you, in the darkness, in the thick of it. And you can know, okay, my suffering, my pain and anguish, it does not mean God doesn't love me. He obviously loves Jesus. Like I, and so when, you, when your heart is broken, when you are frustrated, when you, when you deep disappointments, deep unmet dreams and expectations, he's there. And even when you can't see him, he, he always sees you. He always sees you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that in your infinite wisdom and goodness, you have given us passages like Exodus 5 uh, that show us this is going to be hard, um, that life is going to be full of disappointment and suffering, even for doing the right thing. 
and yet you've given us a Savior who shows us that there's nothing we could go through on this side of glory that even compares to what he went through to win us. And so, Father, these, these promises, these gospel promises that we cling to, would, would, would they not be trite? Would they not be cliche? Would we not roll our eyes at them? Would we cling to them like a life raft in the middle of a raging sea, in the middle of a dark storm? Because uh, that's where most of us find ourselves. And so, Father, help us see Jesus even in the dark. We need your spirit. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.